Thank you very much, Dean Lauscher, for your introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hunter Klee, and I am a doctoral candidate at The Ohio State University. I will be graduating with my PhD in Chinese language pedagogy in May. I have seven years of experience uh, teaching Mandarin Chinese at the college level. And today I will be presenting some of my findings from a study that I conducted this spring uh, for my dissertation. Uh, so I observed some performance-oriented Chinese language classes, and what I found in my observations were very interesting. The key takeaway uh, is that there are some lessons in language and culture that need to be physically experienced in order to be understood. So let me tell you about my study. For the first part of my study, I observed two Chinese language classes that use a language learning approach centered around performance. In the second part of my study, I interviewed students about their experience in class. I observed uh, several weeks of classes, but there was one lesson in particular that I would like to share with you today. I found those results particularly interesting. I chose to observe lesson 4.2 from a textbook series called Chinese Communicating in the Culture. This is a highly performable lesson that is based on a scene in a movie called Mo Shen de Peng Yo, or Strange Friends. So let's take a look at lesson 4.2 entitled Inviting a Friend to Partake. In the following conversation on a train from Beijing to Fuzhou, Du Qiu is determined to form an in-group of travelers. <coughs> Uh, one way of showing his intentions is to offer cigarettes and things to eat to those sharing seats near him. So below we see the dialogue presented in pinyin, and then to the side there are some photos indicating, uh, those are screenshots from the movie, indicating the characters and their position as they speak. Uh, students also have access to an audio recording of this dialogue, as well as the video, the clip from the movie that this dialogue comes from. So since students study that, let us also take a look at that video clip. Now, you may find this dialogue strange or even objectionable. <laughs> I would understand why. Right? In China, we don't smoke on trains anymore. This is admittedly a bit outdated. However, this is not a valueless lesson. There are still lots of pieces to this lesson that have merit. And if we take past, cast aside the parts that are outdated, there are still some useful things in here, Con particularly if we consider the physical gestures in this scene that are still relevant today. So I said this was a highly performable lesson, and indeed there's a lot of physicality involved in moving objects, uh, using hand gestures, um, changing eye contact from person to person, giving emotional facial expressions. The speakers offer, they reject, they insist, and they finally accept objects. And all of these social acts require a great deal of physicality to be meaningful. Let's see how the students do when they perform this dialogue. <clears throat> so um, I observed two classes of second semester Chinese. One, uh, the first class happens early in the morning, and class two occurs right after class one. One instructor teaches both classes in succession. Uh, by the way, I did video record these class sessions, but I will not be showing those videos today out of respect for students' privacy. Instead, I will be showing illustrations much like these that will illustrate uh, the gestures that the students used. So observations begin with class one, where the instructor leads students through their first day in the lesson. Students will do this lesson three times. This is their first introduction to the material, though they have previewed it and are ready to perform this from the night before. So the instructor begins class and chooses three students to come to the front of the class and perform the lesson and provides them with cigarettes. Not real cigarettes, of course. They provide a prop, something like uh, crayons or chalk in a box. Don't worry, there's no tobacco in the classroom. So the students perform. Here, have a cigarette. I have some here. Notice that the student put his hands up to refuse the offer. Hey, we're out on the road. When we meet up, we're friends. Take one. OK, thanks. Here the student delivers the line just like the textbook says. And he accepts the cigarette, 
uh, with one hand. So let's actually pause here and examine this acceptance uh, act that we just saw. So after Du Qiu says, we're friends, take one, the student playing Tongsheng put his hand out and he accepted the cigarette. But that's not what happened in the movie. Maybe you saw it. In fact, what the student should have done but did not do is put the hands up and still refuse just one last time. <laughs> right? Does this sound like a familiar behavior? You refuse just a little bit more to seem courteous? Right, so the student did not pick up on this lesson, even though the student had studied the textbook, had listened to the audio materials, and had watched the movie before. The student did not notice this very subtle physical gesture. But that physical gesture carries a lot of meaning, right? So the student uh, did not engage in a second refusal, and that's the key. That's really the interesting part here. So there's a Chinese lesson, there's a Chinese cultural lesson, a, beha a behavioral culture lesson that is being missed by the student. So the teacher had all 10 students perform each role, uh, and the passenger, and there was never a situation where the students engaged in a second refusal. All 10 students, none of them did it. Interesting. So class ended, the students went away, and the teacher thought that wasn't really an ideal performance. It wasn't quite authentic enough for me. I would like to increase the student's authenticity and I will do it through their physicality. I will use a different approach for class two. 15 minutes later, class two enters the room and the teacher begins by showing them the video immediately and pointing out through use of her own hand gestures, a refusal, hoping to cue students in to this need for a second refusal. Teacher steps aside and has the students perform. And just as Du Qiu offers, the student who is playing Tongsheng accepts and takes a cigarette, just like class one. <laughs> what happened? The student playing Tongsheng did not engage in a second refusal. However, the teacher decided to intervene. And here's where the two classes are different in my observations. The teacher jumps in immediately and puts her hands up and signals to the student, refuse again. She does not say this in English, she just mm, 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 does this gesture. The student mimics her, but then says in English, but I already did that. The timing is still not clear to the student, and so the teacher plays the film again and points out the very moment when Tongsheng actually does the second refusal. Some of the students get it. Oh, you can hear the classroom start to understand. But just to make sure that the point is very clear, the teacher becomes Tongsheng and interacts with Du Qiu, off asking Du Qiu to insist. So Du Qiu offers the cigarettes again, and all the students know the next line is, OK, thanks, Hao xie xie. But the teacher keeps her hands up. This is new to the students. They've never experienced this. So what must the student playing Du Qiu do? Has to push. Now we have physical insistence. Now we have meaning making in a Chinese culturally appropriate way. And once the student pushes the cigarettes into the hand of the teacher, then the teacher can <sighs> reluctantly accept. Now they all get it. The teacher steps away. The student performs again with success. They engage in the second refusal. The student playing Hongsheng did perform second refusal. However, they only did it after being physically coached through the process by an intervention by the instructor, live, paying attention and giving explicit corrective feedback. The instructor had all of the rest of the class perform this and never had to remind anyone to do the second refusal again. All 10 students in the class did it, never had to remind them. They learned from watching the teacher instruct that one student one time. Well, that's great, one day. What about the next day? Day two, right? They learn this lesson for three days. What happens during day two? Well, class one was not told to do a second refusal. No one told them, so they didn't do it. Class two, the teacher did not tell them to do a second refusal, but they did it. They knew that this was part of the appropriate, appro culturally appropriate behavior and that they should do it. They had this memory. So that's the next day. Now, what about day three? Well, we had a holiday vacation of one week. <laughs> you can already make some assumptions about what's going to happen. 
But class one never realized that there was a second refusal to do. They never figured it out. They have access to the same materials, the book, the lesson, the audio, the video. They have all of it. But they never realized that that tiny little gesture was there. Class two, natural. This is just how you behave. This is the right thing to do. So uh, after I did my classroom observations, I interviewed some students about their uh, learning experience. And what I found was, oops, sorry. What I found was that class one uh, believed that they performed everything correctly. They thought that they did it exactly like in the movie, um, and that everything they did was accurate. Of course they did. They didn't ever hear otherwise. And class two, they were more focused on how um, natural everything felt. When I asked them why they did these gestures, they said, that's, that's how I normally behave. Is that how you normally behave? Mm -hmm. The students in class one never did it. Is that how you normally behave? So I mentioned to them, I asked them, did the instructor ever tell you to do this? I don't think so. <laughs> they forgot. They completely forgot. It felt totally natural to them to do the second refusal. So let's look at some results from, uh, from the interviews. When I asked this student from class one um, about her performance, uh, she indicated that she wasn't messing up her gestures or anything. So I didn't mention gestures. She brought this up herself. So she recognizes that gesture is important. Physical performance is a necessary component to this dialogue. But actually, she didn't provide all of the physicality necessary to make it a completely meaningful and culturally appropriate interaction. Um, most students believe that they had mimicked the physicality exactly like in the film. This student says, doesn't he accept it right away in the movie? I'm just mimicking exactly what they do in the movie, to me, really. So he thinks so, but he didn't. Uh, clearly, we can see that watching the video is not enough to learn this lesson. Just purely watching, there needs to be some sort of physical intervention by an instructor so that these students can learn there are some aspects of physicalized behavior that make uh, your language use more effective and more culturally appropriate. This student in class two actually said, take it twice. She went off script, um, Naja, Naja, uh, which is not what's written in the book. And so I asked her, why did you do that? And she said, I don't know, it's just something inside. I just do it without thinking about it. So the students in class two have internalized something. Uh, I asked uh, this student, when, when this student saw video, uh, by the way, these interviews are all uh, video um, stimulus response uh, interviews. So they're watching video of themselves as I'm asking these questions. So this student watches video of herself and uh, re realizes that she had no awareness. I didn't realize that I did these actions until I saw them in the video. Um, I just never focused on it. So this was also internalized action uh, by this student. Uh, performance, uh, this performance-based approach gives students a sense of immersion in the script. Uh, this student said uh, that they could focus on other things besides what was coming out of their mouth, in part because they had learned all of the text previously. They understood the grammar, they understood the words from the night before. They came into class and were free. They were free to focus on their physicality, on the relationships they were building between other speakers, and the context surrounding the uh, interaction. So, class one never noticed the second refusal. They believed that they mimicked the film correctly. Class two, they understood it. They forgot the instructor ever intervened. They had some differences, but both felt that their performances were natural to them and they were confident in their abilities to offer, to reject, to insist, and to accept. But you know which class actually was more effective in doing this. So I have a couple of quick pedagogical suggestions. Before class, I would recommend when doing a performed, uh, a, a lesson which focuses on performance like this, to select lessons that are highly performable. Reading a newspaper article is valuable, but it's not necessarily performable, like a dialogue is. 
A dialogue where individuals manipulate objects or they communicate their emotional stances, these are highly performable lessons. Uh, performances should inform the students something about Chinese culture, however, like the common practice of refusal before ultimate acceptance. Take note of what gestures are essential to a scene and what students are likely to miss. In class, direct the scene much like the instructor did in class two, modeling those complicated actions with complex timings. Timing can be difficult. This is rehearsal, and all good performances require some good rehearsal. Okay. Incorporating physicality in performance leads to an experiential embodiment of the culture. It's so much more powerful when students do things physically with their bodies, and we as language teachers can guide our students in this regard to perform as culturally competent learners even as early as year one. I welcome your feedback and questions during our Q&A. Thank you so very much. <笑>好那么下边我们就是可以提问了我们这两位老师他们根据他们的内容下面有哪位老师想提问好就上边应该有是吧好的好那么第一个问题感觉陈老师的 也许可以成为将来课程设计的一个方向，这是一个鼓励，不是问题，是吧？我可以来一下吗？那个我们现在之前看到只是scenario，那今年的目标我们在那个呃每个module里面要挑一个呃，就是最具有代表性的scenario来
And, and I think this is one reason why we all don't have to worry too much about being replaced by computers in the future. <laughs> there will always be a place and a need for live teachers working with students in person. Maybe in the future, instead of five days a week, we'll be working three days a week and the other two days uh, artificial intelligence or something, but there will always be a place for, for live, for well-trained uh, and experienced live teachers. Uh, a quick question to Quilacher. Um I love the detail and thoughtfulness and care you gave to teaching refusals in this case. And of course, ideally, one would do that in that degree of detail for all of the different functions that we identify for our Chinese curriculum. But if you do that, are we going to cover enough inventory? In other words, words and grammar patterns and characters and all of that. So perhaps it's not possible for every function we just uh, give examples of a few and, and the rest of it students will have to sort of Uh, I, I very much agree. We have to be choosy about which lessons we do for this sort of physical performance. You can't do everything. Life is far too complex. Uh, you can't teach how the physicality of every life circumstance, but there are some circumstances that are especially worth teaching, some things that are broadly applicable across categories. And I think that giving and, re and accepting items is broad enough. Uh, that it's it's worth it. So I think the teacher must use their own discretion to choose when physicality is a necessary part of the physical grammar lesson.我鼓励的话实际上是我写的 特别重视的一个问题，所以说我这点感觉，柯老师的这个呃报告特别特别好啊。为什么我是让我想到柯老师这个包括可以跟陈老师的这个联合起来呢？呃，对，因为我我我是感觉是有这样一个问题，因为我